Hello Steelers and welcome to this video in which I'm going to go through the stages of building and painting these Battlefront 15mm SU-85 and SU-100 models. These are designed for use in Flamers of War, but I'll be using them in other games such as O-Group, Chain of Command or IMB Shotmum. Soviet armoured fighting vehicles from the Second World War are quite similarly painted throughout the conflict, so you could easily use these techniques on other AFVs. However, before we start, let's have a bit of history. I'm going to add chapters to the video so you can skip forward to the building and painting if you don't want to listen to the history part. Tanks took a prominent role in the fighting in the Second World War, having been developed and first used in the First World War as infantry support. This came with the need for a dedicated mobile anti-tank capability, as all nations developed their own armoured fighting vehicles, and the Second World War saw a huge expansion of tank destroyer types. Some of these began as a stopgap way of mounting anti-tank capability onto a mobile platform, but they also spawned their own specific type of vehicle, of which the Soviet SUs were part of. SU stands for Samohodneya Ustanovka, the literal translation being self-propelled installation. Tank destroyers are an interesting breed of AFV, with both pros and cons, so let's examine some of these. From a manufacturing point of view, tank destroyers fill a cheap gap by being able to mount a large calibre weapon on an already existing chassis, meaning little new design work or manufacturing techniques are required. Tanks traditionally have turrets, which are only physically able to mount certain guns, as a balance against the weight to power output of the engine and the chassis. An oversized gun wouldn't work in the small confines of a turret, and an enlarged turret wouldn't work on a small chassis. By doing away with the turret, the tank destroyer creates more space for a large gun to be mounted. Also, this does away with the need for expensive and complex turret components, and the requirement for manufacturing the turret itself. It also means that a new generation of gun type can be mounted on what might be an obsolete chassis, in turn using the existing chassis that would still be in the process of manufacture. Further to this, the silhouette of a tank destroyer was naturally lower than a tank, due to the lack of turrets and the gun being buried in the superstructure. This made for an excellent weapon for use in ambush positions, with manoeuvrability to evade enemy fire when the location was detected. However, the cons of the tank destroyer should be self-apparent, the main one being the lack of traverse with a gun not mounted in a turret. Limited scope for targeting make the tank destroyers vulnerable to flank and rear attacks, but emplacement in a good ambush position negated this somewhat. Also, using outdated chassis could mean that they were under-armoured against the more modern battle tanks. Again, this was negated somewhat by the low cost of production and the simplicity of construction, meaning that they were relatively quick to produce in great numbers. Germany made great use of tank destroyers throughout the Second World War, mounting bigger and bigger guns on their old chassis types, such as the Marder series, and also the famous Stugs, which took the Panzer III chassis well beyond their battlefield capabilities as a battle tank. As Germany's war became more defensive, they turned to more powerful tank destroyer types, such as the Jagdpanther and the Jag Tigers. Meanwhile, the Soviets began mounting large guns on existing chassis to counter the German tanks after the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. The Su-76 mounted a 76.2mm anti-tank gun on the existing T-70 light tank chassis, and this was the first properly operational Soviet tank destroyer. This was followed by the Su-85 and then later the Su-100. The numbers referring to the calibre of the gun in millimetres. The T-34 tank chassis was used for both of these vehicles and the 85mm gun was bigger than the original gun mounted on the T-34s, that is, the 76mm gun. When the T-34 turret was redesigned and enlarged to take the 85mm gun, the Su-100 was then used to mount the larger 100mm gun. The Su-85 was created as a direct counter to the German Tiger and Panther tanks, which had begun to appear on the battlefield from late 1942 and the middle of 1943, respectively. 2,650 Su-85s were produced between 1943 and 1945. Despite being able to handle the earlier German tanks, it was soon found that the 85mm gun had limited effects against the bigger German vehicles which is why the upgunned Su-100 was developed, mounting this 100mm gun. However, immediately the lack of 100mm guns meant that the Su-85M had to be produced as a stopgap, which mounted the existing 85mm gun on the Su-100 chassis, which had got thicker armour. 
The Su-100 entered service in autumn of 1944 and remained so until the war's end, with a production number of almost 5,000 vehicles. In fact, both types of these Su's were exported to various Soviet states and were used long after the Second World War had finished. Photographs from 2016 show a knocked out Su-100 from the conflict in Yemen. Now with the history out of the way, let's start the build. I'm concentrating on the Su-85 for this video, but the Su-100 follows the same procedure. Battlefronts have instruction articles on their website, which is very helpful for knowing which bits go where. I'll put a list of the paints and the materials I use in the video description. The first thing to do is to work out which parts you'll need, as there are lots of options on the sprues. I mark all the required pieces with a permanent marker and then clip them off using some metal clippers. Once I have separated all the pieces, I need to clean up the nubs of plastic left from the sprue and with the edge of a sharp scalpel, I use it to scrape away the excess. Do this very carefully as the plastic is soft and it can be easy to take chunks out of the model itself. Don't worry though, as this can have some looks of battle damage and dents anyway. Then starting with the tracks, I begin the build using liquid polystyrene cement. This melts plastic and forms the bond, so make sure you dry fit any parts prior to gluing them as once this is set it will be difficult to repair any mistakes. Build the lower hull, then attach the upper hull half to this. The battlefront plastic kits are really nice and they go together very easily, but remember just to dry fit them first, just in case you're not sure. I add the barrel mounting and the gun barrel along with fuel tanks on the side. I also add some of the extra tracks for armour protection at the front. You could stop here if you wanted to. However, I add some third party stowage which I bought from various places and I have in my bits box. I glue this down with super glue and I put it in places where the crew would store it. Stowage is a great way of breaking up a vehicle's shape and also adding interest to the model. It also adds a bit of colour to an otherwise monochrome vehicle. Whilst I leave the glue to dry, I begin work on the bases. Now, some people don't like basing tanks for wargaming, but they're simply wrong and you don't need that kind of hate in your life to be frank. I cut some 2mm plastic card off cuts to the size of the vehicles using a sharp knife. I then clip the corners and sand them smooth to round off the edges and give them a more organic look than having sharp 90 degree angles on the base. Before getting back to the SUs, I paint the bases in Vallejo's flat earth. This will probably need two coats, so I paint one now and then go back later to finish off with a second coat. Now it's time to begin prepping the vehicles for painting, and for this I mount them on an old Vallejo paint bottle. I use super glue and attach the vehicles to the top of the bottle at the point of balance. Super glue is a brittle bond so you can easily slap them off when the painting is completed, don't worry. When the super glue is dry I begin painting using the bottle as a holder. If you want, you can use primer to prime your model here, either with a rattle can, an airbrush or just by hand. However, I have found that I rarely need it and I use the base coat of the vehicle as a primer in itself, killing two birds with one stone. I use Vallejo's Russian Green and apply it with a largish brush, ensuring to get into all the nooks and crannies. As we are using this as a base coat and primer, I'll give it two coats, just to ensure there is good coverage and I haven't missed any bits. I let the Russian Green dry, preferably overnight just to ensure it is completely cured, and then using Citadel's Nuln Oil, I apply a wash over the entire vehicle. This is a black ink wash, and it will get into all the areas of detail and give a good shading effect. Once this is completely covered, leave the model to dry thoroughly overnight if possible. With the null oil completely dry, it's time to begin the highlighting. And for this, I use this large soft brush and Vallejo's Russian uniform. Wiping off a lot of the paint onto a cloth or a piece of kitchen towel, I begin dry brushing the model. Work slowly and lightly at first, and you can build this up slowly to get the effect that you want. This will hit the high parts of the kit and give it a slightly lighter look than the rest of the shaded model. I then turn my attention to the stowage. I paint this in various colours, depending on what the actual stowage is. So this will be light brown for ammo boxes, various greens and browns for cloth bundles and other equipments. I just make sure that this is a different colour to the vehicle, just to add that interest that I mentioned before. Then the next thing to tackle is the tracks. I use a medium brush and I paint these in Vallejo's black, and ensure that I get into all the areas between the road wheels. I try to be as neat as I can here, but I don't worry too much as I can cover up any mistakes with weathering later. I did forget to do it here but I would also paint the spare tracks on the hull as well. I came back later on and I did this. As the tracks dry I give the stowage a wash in Citadel's Agrax Earthshade. 
a brownish wash, which is similar to Null Noil, but is slightly more organic looking. Now that the tracks are completely dry, I use a medium brush and I go over the tracks using Vallejo's Gun Metal. I just give this a really heavy dry brush and make sure that I can still see some black below the Gun Metal. Again, I don't worry about this being messy as it can all be covered later with the weathering. The next and final stage for the tracks is to coat them in Flory Wash Rust. This is a clay wash which goes on quite bright but it dries dull and has a really nice texture to it. All of the Flory Washes are great products for painting with so I thoroughly recommend them. I'll also use this on the exhausts as well. I finish the stowage by repainting the base colour back over the top of the upraised areas and emphasising the highlights. Don't worry you'll not see too much of this at tabletop distance so don't worry if it's a bit messy. Then is the final weathering stage and for this I dry brush fawn over the bottom of the hull and the tracks to create a tide mark of rain and mud. This fawn colour is a light khaki colour and it works perfectly for the look of dried mud and dust. I then seal the model with Windsor & Newton's Professional Artist Matte Spray. This is the best varnish on the market in my opinion. It is pricey but you certainly get what you pay for. Then I go back to the bases and using undiluted PVA I paint this across the bases and sprinkle static grass over the top of it. You could use an applicator here but I never have and I never really see much difference for my needs anyway. Once this is dry I finally attach the models to the bases using super glue and I press down hard to create a good bond. And that's it, the SUs are completed. These are really nice kits by Battlefront and they were an absolute pleasure to build. The painting is straightforward and it's really simple to do. I hope this video has given you some ideas about painting Soviet armour for your World War II games. If so, please hit that like button and leave a comment. Also, please subscribe to the channel if you aren't already and check out my Patreon and channel memberships if you want to help support the channel. And I'll see you in the next video.